What's up, Red Letter Disciple? I hope you're having a great day wherever you are. The mission of this podcast is to challenge you, wherever you are, whoever you are, to be the greatest disciple of Jesus that you can be. Because when we all become the greatest disciples, we give the world a greater, fuller, more beautiful expression of Jesus. That's what changes the world. I welcome my co-host, Chris Johnson, in a couple of minutes and one of his friends who has become my friend in this show, an incredible guest, Dr. Joel Hunter, to the episode, to the podcast today. So Dr. Joel Hunter, he, (laughs) have you ever wondered like, what would it be like to sit in the Oval Office? What's it like to be the spiritual advisor to the president of the United States of America, the leader of the free world? Dr. Joel Hunter sat in that role. And so we're going to dive into that. He's going to tell us a few things that maybe we don't know about the role of the president and what they go through, what they experience. He's going to share some stories that I bet you've probably never heard anywhere else. And at the same time, he's going to get really practical. This is something I I truly wrestle with. I bet you do too, of what's my role as a disciple of Jesus and, and for me personally as a pastor, what's my role politically? Like, it it feels so combative out there and and I just don't feel like it's right. I bet that you don't feel like it's right either. So he's going to, he's going to really help us. And he's got firsthand experience that I think is going to be powerful for us. So today's episode is going to be fun. Before we get to it, let me thank our sponsor, Red Letter Living for today's podcast. Here's what we do at Red Letter Living. We create resources that help challenge people of all ages to be greater followers of Jesus. And we can challenge your church and pastor and church leader. We love creating resources to help you in your church. One of those resources we have that's free for you is the super simple, easily doable five-step guide to growing your small groups. Let me say that again. The super simple, easily doable five-step guide to growing your small groups. You can grab this PDF at freeredlettergift.com, freeredlettergift.com. Healthy churches are marked by many characteristics. And one of the most common is, are your people connecting in relationships through small groups? Every pastor knows it's important, yet a lot aren't too happy with where their small groups are right now. The good news, you can grow your small groups. In fact, we've helped uh, about a thousand churches churches grow their small groups. And so it's doable. It's not as hard as you think. I'm not saying it's no work, but what did the, what did the guide say? Super simple, easily doable. So there is some work, but it's, it's possible. So we want to give you that gift at freeredlettergift.com. I hope it's a blessing to you. If you like the PDF, share it with another pastor friend. If you like this podcast, tell a friend, share it on social media, hashtag red letter disciple, rate and review, follow and subscribe because we Love helping you become a greater disciple. And I think you're going to love today's episode with Dr. Joel Hunter. So here we go. Let's do this. I'm pumped for today's episode of Red Letter Disciple. We've got Dr. Joel Hunter in the house today. And Dr. Hunter served as senior pastor of Northland Church in Longwood, Florida for 32 years. And just thousands upon thousands of people that he has impacted In 2017, he transitioned from that role on a mission to, quote, go from my best interpretation of what the Bible says to my best imitation of how Jesus lived. I'm going to ask him about that. I love that quote. That's great. In 2018, Orlando Magazine listed him as the number one most powerful voice for (laughs) philanthropy (laughs) philanthropy (laughs) and community (laughs) engagement. And 2019 was the sixth year to be highlighted as one of Orlando's 50 most powerful. Uh, He's a full-time volunteer now and and just does a whole bunch uh, kind of around justice and, and bringing Jesus to people. Uh, president, faith-based president of Parable Foundation, uh, started a movement with some others called Simple Help. And so we're here today to have a great conversation with Dr. Joel Hunter. So Dr. Hunter, welcome to the Red Letter Disciple. So good to have you. Thank you. It's great to be with you guys. And and yeah, uh, phil- philanthropy is Yeah, how that's you say what it is. It. So, that's okay. Yeah, it's a, it's okay. It, in fairness, it's a long <laughs> word. It's a, it's a long word. Hey, Dr. Hunter, I've known you for a while now, and I have an opening question for you. Uh, and it's what Zach kind of touched on. But you, I first off, it, I have a church down the street uh, from you in Lake Mary, uh, where Northland, you drive by Northland, and it's just a beautiful. And you know, the, I know a lot of the employees over there and a lot of people that worship there. And it's just so amazing uh, what has been built, what God has led you guys to over there. And I'm curious, first and foremost, um, you were the guy there. When people <laughs> talked about Northland, they talked about 
Dr. Hunter. And, uh, and I'm wondering, was that really a hard decision to kind of just say, hey, I think I'm going to try something else? No, it wasn't. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the, the decision was made when the elders uh, came to me. I, I, I hosted, I lasted there for 32 years. There was, there was never a scandal. There was never a right. huge split in the congregation. It was a healthy, wonderful congregation. Uh, and so I'm so thankful for my time there. Uh, but I was 69 years old at that time. And uh, I had hosted, I have a talent for getting myself in trouble with conservatives. <laughs> and and I, I had that talent too. a serious series of what were probably controversial looking back on that forums. I just wanted a broader understanding of how the church uh, could do some good. But we had a series on racism. We had a series on um, the uh, rising tide of violence, a series on um, the injustices uh, um, in the in the uh, the penal system, and but the the piece of resistance was we had an open forum on um, addressing LGBTQ community yeah. uh, as people with respect. Uh, huge crowd. Um, um, but not too long after that, the elders came to me and said, you know, you're not, you're not getting any younger here. We, we would never, you know, want you to leave, but it's time to kind of put a succession plan in, in motion. Um, and at that time, I was kind of chafing under some of the restrictions of any um, institutional um, expression of religion. Um, I, I wanted to have conversations without thinking, okay, is this going to divide my career and so on and so forth. So, so I, at that time, I just took it as the Lord's leading, mm -hmm. uh, that my time as a congregational pastor was done. Um, partly because, uh, after 32 years, if you stick around, the next guy has no chance. I yeah. mean, the, the I, congregation is going to turn to you. Yeah. And so, I'm sure they didn't think this through, but but they couldn't. They want to make me emeritus, and I said that, that don't that won't work. So anyhow, it was at that time when I went on to do some things that I couldn't do as a congregational pastor. Right, right. So I, a couple of follow up questions to that. Uh, I mean, you planted Northland, right? I mean, it, no, I came. I I I I, I planted the rebirth of Northland. Northland had existed um, for 13 years before I came. Um, and they had, they didn't have a building and then they bought this old rat infested roller skating rink. Right. I remember. Uh, and it was about that time that the, the, the church went underwent a, like a huge split. Yeah. Um, and, and there was only about a hundred, maybe 150 people who were actually wondering whether or not they should continue as a church. And they reached out to me. Uh, they they just did this nationwide church, uh, search. I was at that time the senior pastor of the second largest United Methodist Church in Indiana, mm -hmm. attendance-wise. I was 37 years old. But God was telling me that I needed to make sure I wasn't doing it for all the perks and all of the prestige. Um, and so he told me, and this is a whole different conversation, you need to walk away from all this and start all over again. Mm. Um, and so uh, that's, a, again, it's a whole different, it's a long story. Sure. Uh, but it was very evident when I came to Northland um, that I just came to love on the people there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but it really was a reboot. Uh, um, and what we built was not like anything they had before. Yeah. And, and so Zach brought it up and it, it, and you said this, go from my best interpretation of what the Bible says to my best imitation of how Jesus lived. We both love that line, but can you talk a little bit about more about that? And how's it been going? Are you yeah, doing well? That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I sure am much more free mm. to follow the example of Jesus. 
uh, without the weight of an institution um, and the constant consideration uh, of uh, position and posturing and all of that kind of stuff that comes along with being the senior pastor of a huge mega church. And right. so my, my sense is, especially in our culture today, and you guys would know this better than I do, that people are always wanting to debate doctrine and scriptures and who has the right interpretation and, and, and they're wanting to win arguments. Uh Um, I don't think that's how Jesus lived or what Jesus was interested in. Um, I think Jesus just wanted to love on people, especially those who have been left out. Uh Um, And so I I began my ministry uh, as part of the civil rights movement. I had always had a heart uh, for those who had been left out. Yeah. And so I saw my graduation from um, congregational uh, pastoring uh, back into that life where I could really pay attention to marginalized people. That's really cool. So part of your bio that I didn't read that I think is fascinating I, that I'd love to press into for a little bit is you had an opportunity to serve as a uh, spiritual advisor to President Barack Obama. And so obviously without breaking confidence and sharing national secrets with us, <laughs> unless you want to, that'd be good for us. <laughs> um, <laughs> If you're going to, let us know so we can clip yeah, that we'll, out. Yeah, we'll, we'll mark it yeah, that way. Yeah, mark it. And, yeah. Um, but hey, tell us two or three things that the common person doesn't realize when it comes to what a president has to go through. Yeah. That's great. Um, well, first of all, um, I, I remember one of my first conversations with him in the Oval Office. It was just uh, myself and T.D. Jakes were there, was there. Um, and Bishop Jakes uh, ask him that the question, what is it that, uh, that, it, that may surprise people is, it was very much like this question. Um, uh, or what may, su- what surprised you, uh, now that you've been in this job just for, uh, I think it was that at that time, a matter of weeks. Um, and, and, and president Obama said, most people don't realize that um, when a problem reaches this office, um, it's, uh, I can't remember his exact words, but basically what he was saying was by the time it reaches this office, it's almost unsolvable. Um, um, because it has been through so many iterations, um, and so many people have worked on it. Uh, and if it gets to me, um, it's just something we're going to have to do the best we can with. Wow. People think that the president has all the power in the world, mm. um, and he really does not, uh, or she really does not, um, because um, um, you have to work within certain boundaries, both constitutionally uh, and politically. Um, so basically what he, what he was saying was um, there's there's no huge wins here where everybody goes, Oh, wow. We waited for the genius to get here and he got here. (laughs) Um, And it's it's a it's a matter of um, he didn't say this, but it's almost um, a a position of ambivalence. You know, you 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 do what you think is right. Mm -hmm. Um, You take the opportunity you think you have, um, but you'll probably never make just that big. solution that nobody has thought of before yeah good or bad yeah yeah is there a moment when you're sitting in the oval office with td jakes and the president of the united states of america and thinking to yourself holy cow this is really something that is that was the only moments i had during my several trips to the oval office it was like what i I tell everybody i've lived this forced gump life you know (laughs) I'm a man of below average abilities that somehow got pasted into history. Um, and it's just, and you're the whole time you're thinking, what am I doing here? I'm from a cow town in Ohio, little old, and, 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 and here I am talking with the president one-on-one um, praying with him. Um, and, and you just, you have this sense of awe the entire time. Yeah. Um, 
not because he gives you that. Mm -hmm. He was a very humble man, great sense of humor, usually the smartest guy in the room. Wow. This guy, this guy was brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, but um, he, so he, he never made me, you know, feel intimidated. But just the setting itself. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just, you know, you'd have to be either really arrogant Mm -hmm. uh, or historically ignorant, right. not to be awed by that situation. Yeah. And so talking about that, I, I have to imagine, I, like I said, I have a church down the street from yours and, and a lot of people in our congregation are very, um, let's see. Um, well, <laughs> they're con they're, they're conservatives, right? They're conservatives. And, and, uh, with that being said, I've said some things in the past that have got me in a little bit of hot water, but I have to imagine when, it, what an honor it is to be considered to even be in that sphere with the leader of the free world that you still got guff when you came back to Longwood, Florida. And I, I, how crazy is that? No, I, are you kidding me? I get a chance to pray with the president. Yeah. Like, well, I'm, you know, it, it wasn't just my congregation. Um, we had, we had blowback, but it was, it was the leaders of other conservative organizations, uh, uh, evangelical organization. I, I'm, I'm going to give you an example here. Yeah, please. Uh, there was, uh, and I, I won't name this person because you would know her. And um, oh, I said, I just said her. Um, <laughs> I'm terrible at keeping uh, secrets, by the way. Just give uh, us uh, initials. again those no, national just... secrets. We're still. <laughs> you know, you know, they're going to come out. They're going to come out. We got to. We got to share this. Be anything confidential. Yeah. But... Now that you've told us that, we're hunting for it. <laughs> But anyhow, she just went ballistic when they asked me to um, say the prayer, uh, the benediction at the Democratic National Convention in Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. It's 84,000 people in the, in the stadium. Um, and they asked me to, to say that prayer. Um, and, and she learned about that. And she went ballistic. And she said, you can't do that. Um, um, and she was very much a Republican, you know, and, and, oh, sure. and, and, and she, she said, promise me, you won't do that until you talk with Billy Graham. And I said, okay. So I, I called Billy Graham. Now this if is about, I have to talk to Billy. Sure. You know, I gotta Billy. You know <laughs> just got to run it by him as everybody does. I like that. You just have Billy Graham on the cell phone. <laughs> well, it was That's a morning cool. call, obviously, but, yeah, yeah. but, uh, but, uh, and, and by this time he's really, old and frail and, and sure. so on and so forth. And I'm, and I'm just thinking, okay, what's it, how, how many machinations is he going to go through to kind of lead me to the right answer here? And so basically, and this is classic Billy Graham. This is brilliant. Um, so I, I got on and we finally got, you know, we got to the point and I said, well, Billy, um, they've asked me to uh, say the prayer uh, at the close of the Democratic National Convention. And of course, you guys know, no one had been in the mobile Oval Office more than times than Billy Graham, both administrations. Nobody had been that kind of the and, path and, to the president. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. He, and, and just many of that. And so, right. anyhow, so Billy says this. You're a pastor, aren't you? Well, of course, he knew I was a pastor. And so I said, yeah. And he said, when somebody asks a pastor to pray, <laughs> you pray. That was it. That was his answer. Brilliant. I yes. mean, got to the point, didn't it? Took yeah. all the politics out of it. Yes. Say, Look, they ask you to pray. Yeah. So anyhow, but the point was that that I have been in almost constant trouble uh, from uh, from national, very conservative leaders uh, to um, those people in my congregation who couldn't get this out of the realm of politics. Mm. For me, it was never in the realm of politics. Right. Uh, the president and I did not talk political, political strategy. We talked about his faith. We talked about his family. Um, we talked about um, um, personal matters um, between, between both of us and what that walk was like and, and how to be um, resilient um, no matter what was coming, how to put things in perspective. Uh, but it was never about politics. 
Yeah, that's just fascinating to me. And would there be times where he would reach out on uh, on certain uh, issues or topics or ideas or thoughts? There were there was, and uh, and but let me tell you even more. This is this gives even more of a an insight to who he was, um, and how personal this was. Um, um, we had gotten a diagnosis. I had a little five year old granddaughter. Um, and, and the, sh- one of the shocks of our life was, um, she kept falling down. They took her to the ER, um, and she had a tumor the size of a lemon in her head, uh. glioblastoma. Um, and I had, I, I was acquainted and was a friend with, sorry, was a friend with, um, Francis Collins, who was then at that time, the head of the NIH. He's the he was the head of the Human Genome Project, and then went over to lead the NIH. And I and I and I called him, and I said, "This is the situation." And I said, "What is the protocol?" And he just said, "Oh, Joel, I'm just so sorry. Uh, we don't have a protocol for five year olds with this with this." And but the first person to call me up was the president, hmm. and he called, and and I don't even know how he found out about it. But before the leaders of my church, before anybody from out of town, before, and he, he opened with, Joel, this is Barack. We just heard. We're brokenhearted. What can we do? Oh. And I said, I said, well, Mr. President, I, I just, you know, I just talked with uh, Dr. Collins and, and there's no, and I kind of broke down. Mm-hmm, sure. And, and. And I had spent our whole relationship kind of pastoring him as well as I could. Um, and, and in that moment, we switched roles. Wow. Mm. And he began to pastor me. And he said, now, wait a minute. I want you to remember that you're not in this alone. I want you to remember that God is with you. Wow. I want you. And it was just one of those, holy cow, not only does he call you concern wanting to know how he can help. But now he's reminding you of God's care. It was just one of those moments that, that I'll, I'll remember for the rest of my life. Yeah. That is really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That's really cool. Also on your cell phone, do you just have the prez when he calls? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that, that never happens. The, 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 the uh, they always, there's always somebody who arranges those calls. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> Becky, and I, Becky and I were driving down 1792 one time and got in front of Win dixie or whatever, mm-hmm. and he had just made a, an announcement he wanted me to know about. But but this is how it usually went. You get, I get a call, um, and and the voice on the other end says, Dr. Herndon, it's the president. Can you take the call? Uh, uh, can you call back in 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I said, oh, give yeah. me two minutes. I got to pull into a parking lot because I'm not talking with the president while I'm driving down 1792. <laughs> yeah, did, uh, you, did you ever not take the call? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, Barack. I'm getting, yeah, I'm busy. Getting Dixie. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. Shockingly, that's how Chris calls me as well. Uh, <laughs> some secretary, yeah, hey, I, president I, I is yeah. here. I'm I like, totally get it. <laughs> I start a little lower. I say the governor of Florida is on the phone. Just so we'll make my call. <laughs> Dr. Hunter, I've always been uncertain, as a, especially as a pastor, but I think just as a common, take the pastor role off of me, as a common everyday disciple as well, of my role politically. Like I've gone more personally along the lines of like, I just don't, I don't do much publicly because I feel like it's too difficult. I can't win. Uh, Personally, I see elements of all parties that are good, that I like, that line up biblically, but I see faults in all of them because they're filled with people at the end of the day. And so I just want to know like how, especially with your, your background, your history, how have you wrestled with that? And what would your advice be to the pastor and also the everyday Christian for how to handle politics in our day? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I do have a background um, in this field. I, my undergraduate work was in history and government. Mm. Um, and so with, 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 even with that education and now with my experience, um, I would say we are at our strongest when we are just doing our best as a citizen 
to decide on the issues as best we can, being informed with scripture, uh, listening to other perspectives. That's really important. Yeah. Um, uh, so that we can vote the best we can. Um, there's basically two, two, um, um, there's a spectrum of power in here with, with almost no power in the middle. Mm -hmm. One is you have a direct personal relationship like I had. Um, the other is you have a personal example of living the values of Christ every day mm -hmm. and your political participation is just part of that. In the middle, it's almost always mere decoration. Mm -hmm. um, um, one of the things that I learned um, when I was invited to, when I've been invited to several uh, of these high um, profile events um, is that you don't, influence anything at a high profile event you're just you're a decoration you're you're there to to show your support uh even if you disagree uh which happened to me recently um but 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 because you you like the larger picture uh you show up um even if that's not your your dance so to speak um and but there's no there's no real um, power in that. There's no real making a difference in that. Okay. So the strongest thing you can do, Zach, um, is to work out what you think is the best approach as far as you know today and act not only with a vote that is corresponding to that, but with an example of what would be a healing um, 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 act or or healing words that would show those values. Hmm. Uh, anything in between really doesn't matter much. So is that example then on the one side, like is that always for you as a Christian then pointing to Christ? Like is he the example then? Is that what you're getting always. at? Yeah. Okay. Always, yeah. How, how's that feel though? Like as, uh, we, and, and go as into detail, as much as you, you feel comfortable uh, when you're at a high profile event and you're mere decoration and you know that, and you also, I think I heard you say, I was just at one and I disagreed, <laughs> <laughs> but for the sake of the larger cause, uh, I think I heard you say, how do you deal with that? Yeah. How do you wrestle with in the moment? I, I'm not feeling great about this or I may disagree, but I, I need to keep my mouth shut, suck it up, whatever it might be. Right. For the larger cause. How do you deal with that? Well, here's, here's a really important thing to remember. We're not God. <laughs> and so we don't, we don't, it's not, are you right? Or are you, or, or are you wrong? It is always, what kind of relationships can you build with not only the people who agree with you, but, with, but with the people who you don't, who don't agree with you. Um, so that eventually, if you are to have any influence for Christ, uh, it will come through that relationship. Mm. You approach it with uh, a humility. Um, you approach it knowing um, that you're going to be ambivalent about what you're doing. You, you're never anybody who thinks things through knows that there are probably valid arguments on the other side. Um, and, and if you really considered those, you, you, you wouldn't be a hundred percent sure you're right. Uh, <laughs> yep. that's called self-righteousness. Um, and so, so the point is you follow Jesus the best you can in the way he lived and the way he loved. Um, and, and you let it go at that. Mm. Um, and, and. You know, at those events where you are surrounded with people who are not like you and don't think like you, um, you learn from them, you listen to them, you treat them with respect, um, knowing that the, at the, that the spirit is, might give them a, a, a desire 
to know more about why you're there mm. um, and to know about who sent you uh, as, as in Jesus yeah. um, and, and why he's there. So it, 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 I, I can, I can, I'm, I'm, well, I probably can't, I shouldn't because, you know, this gets personal, but yeah. uh, there are a number of examples uh, of people who began to talk about Jesus with me, who never would have had that conversation had I not been there. So, yeah. So it's just, it's just part of what you do. Mm-hmm. Dr. Hunter, I know that, um, You've seen this as well. I think the thing that's become disheartening now being, you know, with the same church for 20 years is that people that you know and love and on all spectrums of the political aisle, they um, they kind of act one way in person. And then you see this ferocious side on like social media and you're like, that's not even the person that I know. And, and then you see them in person. They're like, eh, they don't have that kind of reaction. And I guess the thing that's been disheartening over the course of the last two elections, especially is that there are people that have become so combative about politics. And I'm talking about people on the far left, far right, um, that it almost feels like they're putting politics or even more so a a certain political figure above Jesus. Yeah. That they're almost worshiping that person. Yeah. And and yet, you know, they're in the pews every Sunday and you kind of bang your head against the I I don't know. Like, I'm sure you've dealt with that, too. well, we're dealing with that more and more um, in that we are relapsing into political categorizations rather than personal conversations. Yes. It's, it's um, exactly what you're talking about. When, when I was growing up, when I was, when I was you guys' age, uh, that's, that's beyond growing up, but, uh, <laughs> but you know. But back in my day, Chris is older. Uh, than he looks, I so. back in, <laughs> you know, there were Republicans and Democrats that that, that disagreed with each other. Uh, but in you know, um, with Reagan, uh, as with Reagan and Tip O'Neill, they'd go out and have a beer together afterwards. Yeah. You know? yeah. Now it's like you you are seen as a threat if you disagree uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, because we have become so. Um, middle schoolish, you know, middle school is you, you're trying to get an identity, but you define yourself by who you hate, yeah. you know, oh, I hate that. Um, and we're, we're all stuck in middle school now uh, and looking for our group, you know, what, what, what category we, we, and so that's come to the church as well. Uh, and I hate to see it, um, but it's part of, um, it's part of the um, simplistic, um, and the, the tilt toward self-righteousness. We, we, we no longer define ourselves by who we are or what we want. We define ourselves now by what we're against. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's a surefire way to permanent frustration um, and impotence. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's what's happened a lot to the institution too of, of the church and followers uh, of Christ is, yeah, sadly, we're known far more for what we're against than what we're for. Yeah. And exactly. we have so much uh, in agreement of what we're for, but it doesn't win the day a lot of times. Exactly. Um, you know, you look at the early, um, the early birth of the church, the reason, and, and you probably have read this with the rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark. The reason we had the credibility we did um, um, was because we would care for people no one else would care for. Mm. You know, when somebody threw a baby out, we would adopt him, meaning the church. Mm-hmm. When there was a, uh, an epidemic and all the rich people ran for the hills so they wouldn't get sick, we took care yeah. of not only our own brethren, but, but, but people who didn't believe, people who weren't part of our group. So that's how they knew they wanted to be part of something that was larger than the present culture offered them. 
Um, we've got to get back there. We've got, we've got to be more loving, more caring, more helpful than anybody else around us. And that will have its impact eventually. How, how do we get there then? So if that's where we got, and I agree, how, how do we get back there? Well, uh, we, we start with this mentality. What is, and I've, I've done this for quite a while now, but what is a way to go help somebody? Um, I got this little devotion on the Z and, and, and this, the, I tell stories. It's what I do. Um, and, uh, but it always ends up with, let's go help somebody. Mm. Um, and, and if we do that every day, then people are going to be glad to see us coming <laughs> instead of, you know, diving in the doorway uh, or or um, gearing up for an argument. Mm. Um, so not only helping people in, in just any way we can, but encouraging them and um, um, being the kind of people that when we're in a conversation, we're thinking, how can I redeem this conversation redeem being the key word here because this is going south <laughs> you know what positive word can i say that might turn it toward oh maybe maybe this is part of you know us being more helpful instead of us being more critical <laughs> so it's just that it's that resurrection mentality you know i know i know somebody's about to get buried here how can it rise again so mm -hmm. it's just that the little things that are in here that god would have us be redeemers in every in every conversation uh in every um situation that would that's that would that would be helpful yeah that word redeem, redeem is really really great and so uh, andy stanley wrote a book called uh, last year called not in it to win it and I, I really appreciated it and saying you can't make disciples of people that you demonize publicly right. and label as enemies of the faith or the state and and so as christians where do we go from like how do we redeem what what i would say is all has already happened yeah. great if we can have a conversation in that conversation i can we can redeem we can be positive but i, I feel like the I'm not a, I'm a positive person and I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. So I know that we can redeem, but I do believe there's a lot that's been broken hmm. and, and like, right. it's, it, it's right. not like a matter of flipping the switch and today everything is great if we have one great conversation. And so how do right. we redeem what's already been like shattered in, uh, gosh, our history, but especially the last couple of decades, I just feel like it's progressing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really a great question. By the way, I've read that book too. It's a great book. And I've got this hilarious story about Andy, but I'm, I'm not going to. Whoa, 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 whoa. You might have to end with that, buddy. Well, <laughs> it was, oh my gosh. Uh, before the inauguration, um, there was uh, there was always a service at St. John's right across the green from the White House mm -hmm. uh, before you went to the inauguration. Um, and the first, his first inauguration, Obama's, and I was kind of the, for both of them, kind of the, uh, the opening or the MC or whatever. Um, and the first one was TD Jakes, but the second one was Andy Stanley. And, uh, and Andy, I mean, we're, we're sitting there, our, our, we're, we're in the room, all robed up, those who were wearing robes and, and all ready to go. And Andy doesn't show up and doesn't show up. And, and uh and uh and uh, i'm thinking man this guy is really playing it cool you know and i knew him, I knew, I knew him before and he walks in I, I don't know how you know how many minutes before the thing but he's just cool you know just say okay what are we doing here <laughs> becky my wife is 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 back in one of the back pews in the church it was a small church it doesn't see very many people and sandra his wife comes in just looking like and she sits down beside Becky. And Becky said, what's going on? <laughs> Sandra said, we set our alarm. We, <laughs> we, we called for a wake-up call. We rehearsed how many steps it took to get us here, how long it would be to get here. And he said, we didn't get a, our alarm didn't go off. We, we, said, we ran all the way here. And I, and I, and, and I thought, 
how cool is this guy just walking in like nothing happened? He didn't say, I was late. My alarm didn't go off. He just get, went in and assumed his role. Uh, but, but knowing the back story of that, I just I appreciated him all the more. That's yeah, cool. yeah, that's awesome. But I think what his, his and, and, and what he says in his book is absolutely right. We think that progress is going to be made by winning arguments. Mm -hmm. um, and it never will be. Uh, it's only made by loving better and helping more. That's all. That's the progress of the kingdom. Um, and so um, we we don't need to win anything. As a matter of fact, we need to lose many times in order to um, um, let people see there's something more important than being on top. It's great. And so I, I think that's such a huge thing that in order to redeem the brokenness is, is, is actually assuming a posture that uh, for me to help, for me, to, it, it will require cost. It may even require loss. And I'm okay with that yeah. because uh, similar to what we talked about earlier, I'll take a, a quick loss in order for the, the greater thing to come. And so one of the ways that I, I think I'm legitimately personally trying to do this in my life is uh, as a white guy <laughs> that passionately cares about fighting racism. Yeah. Uh, you know, years ago, there was uh, just a, something that um, I had some people in my life that that opened up uh, a little bit of what, what it's really like. And I had this shallow understanding that then in invited me to come to a more deeper understanding. And now that I've had that deeper understanding, my eyes have gotten a little clearer. I want to do what I can to use my platform, my influence, whatever I can to be an advocate in this. And even a couple of the episodes this season of Red Letter Disciple are, are really focused on uh, fighting racism and and yeah. and hopefully seeing it seeing it done. And so I'd love to know from you uh, as part of my own learning journey, but I know there's many others listening as well. Um, I can tell Dr. Hunter, you're white. <laughs> and so I just want to know, man, what have you done that's worked and maybe some things you ha that, that you've done that hasn't worked? Well, uh, this is, this is fairly simple. It's not easy, but it's fairly simple. Um, we do have an advantage. Uh, I've had a historic advantage, um, in our color, uh, in this country. Um, and I did not grow up knowing or realize I grew up in a small town. There were no black people. There were no brown people. There were no Jews except for one that we had one Jewish uh, person who was my Latin teacher um, and um, and one gay person. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so I, I it never it was never on my radar screen uh, until I got to college uh, in the height of the civil rights movement uh, back in the 60s. Um, <clears throat> but what is really helpful um, is to understand um, how important it is to be their advocate, mm -hmm. uh, to speak up for injustice, especially when it comes to bullying. Um, when, it, when The reason that we're given a blessing, and this is for everybody, the reason we're blessed is to bless others. Mm -hmm. Genesis 12, 3 says, you, you know, I'll bless you and through you, every family of the earth will be blessed. Mm -hmm. So the whole reason we've got any power or any position, or any blessing, any advantage, is to give it to someone, and this is through the life of Jesus, who's been left out. Um, his only quarrels, public quarrels, were with religious leaders, you know, of the right religion. Uh -huh. um, and he always sought those who had been left out. And so whether, it's, whether you're talking racism or you're talking about anti-Semitism, the, the, the incidence of anti-Semitism, um, in Florida have risen 40 some percent, hmm. uh, in the last year. Um, it's just remarkable yeah. whether you're talking about, um, the treating LGBTQ people with respect and being their advocate for equal rights. I, I interpret marriage in the traditional sense, but that doesn't at all say that I can't want the same rights for a gay citizen that I have uh -huh. um, and, and, and it's, it's treat them with respect and dignity because they too are made in the image of God. And so you, you, you've got to realize what we have to give. And when we say 
we need to be advocates. We don't just need to say, yeah, everybody deserves equality. You know, we need to do what we can to make the field more level for playing. Um, that's really important from people uh, that are of our color. It's good. Yeah, it's real good. I was just thinking how lonely it must be for the one person in Shelby, Ohio, to be a, a gay person. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I grew up in the Midwest, uh, uh, Anita, Iowa, a very small town of a thousand people. And it, it, same thing that you just described. Like, there was no African-American families. We had one Hispanic family. Um, we had a couple people that we kind of thought might, you know, be in a relationship, same sex relationship. But mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I moved to Iowa city there. I, you know, I saw a lot of that. And yeah. so, uh, and just, well, as and, and it's key to remember, <sighs> there were probably several gay people in Shelby, but only sure. one came out. Right. You know? Right. So there, I mean, all because around they, you. Because they saw what happened to that one person. And <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, and, and this is especially important for people in the church. You know, there are lots of gay people in our churches, uh -huh. you know, um, and we need to be mindful that they're there for the same reason we are. They want to get closer to Jesus. They want to follow Jesus. And so um, to make it safe for them to uh, be able to work through that, um, in their life, the way we got to work it through in our life, that's really important. Dr. Hunter, uh, honest, sincerely honest question. Did you feel like that was becoming harder to do in a big church? Yes, yeah, it, it really. And, and, and let me tell you why. And, and it's not that big churches are worse than small churches. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, but when you've got, we had, I don't know, 110, 120 people on staff. Mm -hmm. um, and when... That's, by the way, on staff, not attending on, the church. Just staff, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, but the, in the back of your mind, you know, as the senior pastor, um, you're always thinking, okay, how do I not divide the congregation? These families are dependent on me for their income. Um, and so there's always the temptation um, um, to either avoid what you should be talking about uh -huh. or to shade it in a way that it becomes an applause line uh, at the expense yeah. of the minority. Uh -huh. um, and that's that's when you know that... You know, you've been listening to the enemy uh, wow. because you, you want power instead of giving up power for somebody else. I also can't imagine having 120 employees. I have two children and I mess their names up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's remarkable. Well, and, and part of it, too, and, and maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong and maybe I'll see differently in emails and stuff I get in the future. But I almost feel like settings like this. Are, are more safe and comfortable, which is crazy because it goes out to the world. Right, right. <laughs> then you have yeah. some of these conversations or, uh, and I, I, conversation is key. I, I, so I, I want to retract a little bit because as pastors, it's mostly a uh, monologue, not a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I just think dialogue is so, with some of these hot button things are, are so difficult. A, a couple things uh, that came to mind as you were speaking, um, you know, for your heart, for the LGBTQ community and, and those in church work, we, we had a great episode on Red Letter Disciple. It was our episode 15 with Mark Schultz. If if someone's listening, like that wants to go deeper in that. Then, then another piece too was just the, we need to be advocates um, for those who are are hurting. It, it was a it was a white dude about my age that actually opened my eyes to black racism, mm -hmm. um, and, and so that that alone is well, like okay, he, cool. He knows him, Ben Hoyer. Yep. Yeah. Oh ben, yeah. Man, ben, 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 yeah. Yeah. Ben was huge in my story to open my eyes in that. But even after he opened my eyes, with probably about ten. Uh, African American friends of mine, all of them, and I don't want to project this on every single black person, but all of them have said, "We want you to use our voice, uh, your voice, I should say, because you can speak to people yeah. uh, with your own style and everything else that we can't, and so yeah. we exactly. want you to." And yeah. so, I think that's so important. 
Oh, uh, Dr. Hunter, quick story, because I we don't get to talk that much. I want to tell you this story. <laughs> All right. So uh, t- doing youth ministry for the last 20 years over at Holy Cross, and we had one African-American student out of our 80 kids that were showing up on Wednesday night. Brilliant kid. He's at UCLA right now learning architecture. But it, it, and everybody loved each other. It was great. He goes, you guys have no idea what it's like to be a black kid in Lake Mary, Florida. Mm. And so I just gave him the floor that night. He goes, <laughs> and he's got, he's got dreads. I mean, he, a 4.25 student with 1500 SAT. He goes, none of that matters. He goes, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take five of you over to the Lake Mary target. And you're going to watch what happens when I go in that store. And so they took him up on it and I went with them. And so we're going, and I am not kidding you. This kid who is going to be designing some killer homes and is such a great family, he's walking down, and we see people look at him and women gl- grabbing their purse, pulling it closer. And he's and the rest of the kids, we came back that night after doing this, and all the white kids are in tears. They're like, I cannot believe you are going through this. That was like one of the practical things that like really opened my eyes. I didn't know it existed to that kind of degree. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's it's, it's a terrible revelation, but it's so needed. Um, People don't understand people don't this. I mean, I think you uh, remember the story about um, president Obama's uh, grandmother or uh, yeah. Grandmother was white. Uh, and confessed her feelings about being uncomfortable or fearful about black people and her grand and to her grandson, you know, who turned um, out to be pretty successful. <laughs> yeah, he turned out all right. You know, so her fears were unfounded, but, but they're there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, one of the things that I saw about you is started a, helped start a simple help movement, and and I think that's so cool. And that's a big piece of what Red Letter is. Is like if everybody. Uh, every day took one step towards Jesus. Exactly. Uh, the world would be different. Tell yeah. me about the simple help movement, what, what that means, what that is, how people well, can it's, it, Now it's just a kind of a, uh, an attachment to uh, the daily devotionals uh, on the radio. But, but the, the whole idea is and was uh, just we, 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 we would send people every day just one thing that they could do, very simple act, to encourage someone or to make the world a better place. Mm-hmm. And, and it was, you know, all the way from, you know, write somebody a note to let them know how much uh, they mean in your life to uh, pick up litter, you know, um, uh, wherever you are and, um, and don't mention it to anybody. Um, <laughs> so, so you get no credit for it. So anyway, just simple stuff like that. It just really, really makes a difference. That's cool. So along those lines, then, we ask every guest to challenge our listeners to do one thing. If they could do one thing this week to grow, um, at, to be a greater disciple, what, what would you challenge our listeners to do? He just said it. Pick up trash. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's, it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. No, I mean, be that person who... Um, who creates instead of guards Mm -hmm. be that person who makes the world better um, instead of just safer. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we had an original um, order in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. Yes. We're supposed to Avad and Shamar. Yes. We're supposed to keep it safe. By the way, this is on on the sides of our police cars, protect and serve. Mm -hmm. Um, and we get really protective, but at many times at the expense of serving. Mm-hmm. So in every conversation, in every action, make sure you're making the world better and not just keeping it safe for those around you. Okay. So awesome. that's the challenge this week. If you do that, hashtag Red Letter Disciple, let us know how you're making the world a better place. 
you don't even have to tell us what you did. Just we want to know if you're in. And it's amazing to see that. Yeah, because if you tell us what you did, you get no credit. Right. So, that's, that's what Dr. Hunter just said. Don't tell You've us. already had it down here on Earth. <laughs> yeah, your, your treasures are on Earth. That's this what... has been awesome. And, yeah. I, you know, I would say I'd love to get the president's number. But since you don't have that, <laughs> uh, we would settle for T.D. Jakes or Andy Stanley <laughs> yeah. since it seems like you have those. Um, <laughs> no, man. Uh, thank you so much. Dr. Hunter, this has been a real blessing. Yeah. Where can people connect? with you find yes. you these days i'm just i'm just uh around uh just google. <laughs> just go outside and say dr yeah hunter. you know google joel hunter and you'll find me that's the best <laughs> answer i'm just that around so good <laughs> yeah. he's batman <laughs> thanks for what you guys are doing this is a uh, really great program and i appreciate this ministry thank really you so appreciate much you. god bless you dr hunter yeah thank you you too you too What an episode that was with Dr. Joel Hunter. So grateful that he came and shared some awesome stories with us and really helped us find, I hope, help you find your place when it comes to politics and faith and what we can do and how we can get involved. And so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hunter, for being on the show. Uh, I also want to thank our sponsor, Red Letter Living. We create resources to help challenge people of all ages to follow Jesus. And we have a free gift for pastors and church leaders, the super simple, easily doable five-step guide to grow your small groups. You can get that at freeredlettergift.com. That is yours. And hey, next week, we got a great episode. We're bringing Brian Rose onto the podcast. Brian is this really genius when it comes to like vision and purpose. And he's doing a new project called Family on Purpose. And so I bring him onto the show to talk about that. You're going to hear his and his wife's story of infertility, how that led them to adoption, and, and, and really think about how best to position their family to, to be disciples in this world. And so it's going to be an awesome story. And I think we're going to get into all sorts of things like how we disciple our kids, how to form a, a mission for our families. How do we like wrestle with kids sports and extracurriculars and the church? And what happens when it snows in Murfreesboro? That's a hard word to say, Tennessee, because that's what that's where Brian lives. And so anyway, it's going to be an awesome episode that's next week on the podcast. So make sure you don't miss it. Follow or subscribe on whatever your favorite streaming platform is. And we'll see you back next week with the Red Letter Disciple. God bless. God bless.